Hi, Will. Hey, man. How are you doing? I was trying to live tweet us, but I'm kind of like, I, I can't do that many things at once, but I think I just live tweeted us. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anybody's still on Twitter, but congratulations on your book. Congratulations on your book. It's wonderful to be in Michigan virtually. Um, wait, are, you're in New York right now, right? I'm in New York City. Um, yeah, although I, I so wish I was at Literati because it's one of my favorite book stories in the world. And I've had the best visits out there. Uh, and John is is a favorite bookseller. So I'm kind of bummed that I'm here in New York City and not there. Where are you at? I'm in New York. I'm in Harlem right now, but you're downtown. But yeah. our hearts are in Ann Arbor right now. <laughs> our hearts are in Ann Arbor. Absolutely. Thank you, John, for the introduction. I'm so sorry that it was so long. But I, I was thinking that I'm here primarily because I am a Will Schwalbe devoted reader. I have evidence. I even have this in hardcover. I have several copies. But um, I wanted to ask you so many. I have so many questions, so many questions. But Primarily, I wanted to ask you, I mean, it's so funny because for those of you who don't know Will personally, and I'm very fortunate because I do know Will personally, is that Will is really friendly and kind and good and smart and all those things. But in some ways, when you talk to Will, you realize he's actually a really private person. Is that right? Like, he's expressive, but he's actually a really private person. So he's not an oversharer kind of <laughs> Like there's like there's nothing like seep correct. there's like nothing seeping out, and then all of a sudden you read his memoirs, and then he tells you all these things. So I was just curious about that sort of the distinction between your public self, which is this friendly, lovely, smart person, and then you also have this very literary, um, expressive, very very um, vulnerable self in your <laughs> memoirs. And I was just curious, like, do you feel like those are two different people or is it the same person? And how do you arrive at that? It's funny because I think people really think of me as an extrovert. And uh, I do love people and I love talking to people and going out and uh, having dinner with people or going to parties. But the kind of irony that you've hit on that no one else has ever hit on is oh. that I'm really an introvert. I'm most yeah. happy at home alone. I need that recharging time. I'm not most happy. That's the wrong way to put it. I really need a lot of recharging time. I need to be with my books and in my own carefully controlled environment. And when I'm out in public, I am quite guarded. I uh, am very private in public. But weirdly, when I get in private, I'm extremely public. I yeah. don't want to go back. And I put everything on the page. And people have this thing they say to me, which is so funny. Uh, when a couple of people read this book, their first reaction was, it's very brave for you to reveal all that. And I didn't think I'd revealed all that, but clearly I have. Well, it's very funny because you're not one of these people who would just sort of take up a lot of space just talking about yourself. Like if you're, if you're in an, in, in a personal conversation with Will Schwalbe, and I'll tell you as a, as a privileged person, he, he doesn't like, you don't um, go on and on and on. Like you're not, you're not somebody who would like, you don't leave the conversation going like, wow, I never, he, not, that person never asked me a question about me. <laughs> if anything, you're the person who actually only asks questions and you you could end up walking away being the asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny it's like my my philosophy of interaction is i know what i'm going to say uh so i'm not really very interested in what i'm going to say because i know it but i don't know what you're going to say so i'm much more interested in what you have to say and that's why when i'm interacting with people i love finding out what they have to say well I do think that this is the mark of the better writers because you are deeply interested in other people and that curiosity is reflected and also it is rendered in the compassion that you give to the people in your memoirs. So when you walk away from having read Will Schwalbe's memoirs, not only do you know Will Schwalbe, the author and the literary persona that is different than the narrator, right? Because the, the narrator shifts in age and in time so that you have young will you have older will and you have the narrator will um you also walk away with a great sense of the 360 of the people around you 
And I was curious because in the book that we're talking about today, the the reversals and the recognitions and the changes that you allow Chris Maxey to have. Could you talk about Chris? Because because this book is about you, but it's also about Chris and it's about the love that you share as two young people who who walk together in life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to give people a little bit of background, it's the book starts. Um, when I was a junior in college and I was an out gay AIDS activist and I knew who I didn't want to know and the people I didn't want to know were the jocks. I found them menacing uh, and they were for the most part. And I was asked to join a secret society which brought together the 15 most different kids at Yale. That was its purpose. Um, it admitted women, the Yale, day Yale admitted women. So it was very definitely co-ed. And uh, I kind of liked everybody, but there was a loud, obnoxious, ultra jock named Chris Maxey. And it is fair to say that Chris, as I call him Maxey, it's all I ever called him Maxey, uh, was a little prejudiced against me, but I was way more prejudiced against him. And I made a lot of assumptions about who he was as a person that were wrong. And, and over the course of the next 40 years, I came to know this man and love this man and realize uh, that he and I share all the same values and he has this immense heart. So that's, that's I don't know if, uh, but I, there are a lot of twists and turns because it's, I kept getting him wrong and I kept disappointing myself by getting him wrong. And I feel that's what makes a friendship dynamic is I'm not sure we ever get each other totally right. Uh, but the, the joy of friendship is continuing to try to do so. Well, I was thinking about this quite a lot in a macro sense, because you, you talk about this theme quite a lot about getting him wrong and how you are humbled by the fact that as a very perceptive person who has met the world, I mean, you're really uh, of New York. You are of New York, so, which means that you have run into everybody, right? You're somebody who takes a subway. <laughs> so yeah. you have seen yeah. everybody. Um, and I do think that in many ways you are of the people, even though you are, you have, um, you have had a wonderful education and a beautiful family. So in some ways, like it wasn't like, you know, you had that kind of experience, but you keep, you, and you talk about getting Chris Maxey wrong, but I was curious, what do you think made you say, oh, I did get it wrong? Because I think for me, what I really see is in this macro sense is a lot of people aren't willing to say I have it wrong <laughs> or, or I could be wrong again. Yeah. Like, and what do you think really taught you or makes you believe that um, you could be corrected? Well, one of the things is he really took the lead in our friendship right from the start, uh, that it was important to him that I like him. And it wasn't just important to him when we first met. It has continually been important to Maxie that I like him. And... I was busy. I want being... you to like me too. I just... <laughs> <laughs> we all want Will to like us. <laughs> well, uh, and I love you. You know that you're you you can be completely secure. We um, I think our biggest bonding moment was at the uh, Texas Book Festival. Um, when, as you recall, no one was all that interested in having dinner with either one of us. <laughs> We I know, were, I know, because they were completely foolish. <laughs> they were completely foolish. So I remember we we had this long bonding dinner in a yeah. hotel restaurant. Really <laughs> and it was really fun. And I thought, I love this person. Um, so uh, I was busy being very guarded and very defensive. And a lot of that was historical in as much as growing up as a gay boy in the 70s, uh, Jocks really did represent menace. And it was a time when it was a perfectly, not just legitimate, but effective defense. If a straight person, man murdered a gay man, all he had to do was say, he came on to me and therefore he had it coming. Uh, and that, that worked, that was like a get out of jail free card. So 
I had a kind of historical reason for being nervous around jocks. But what was terribly unfair to Maxie is long after he proved to me that he was not that person, my mind kept going there. And it, it, I wasn't mean to him. And I wasn't, I just held back. And when I held back, he always was there reaching out his hand, as it were, uh, and bringing me back in. And uh, I had to, to use a common phrase, get over myself. Oh, it's so interesting. Well, this pursuit, because what you're really talking about is identity and groups, right? And this is the reason why we have this alleged culture war, because we have identity, we have factionalism saying, you know, this is what gay people believe, this is what straight people believe, this is what jocks believe, this is what Asians believe, this is what Republicans, Democrats. And, and for me, that was really important about this book, because what you do is as a storyteller, you have this sort of empathy machine that you built into this piece, where you, you actually do flail yourself quite a lot, saying, I messed up. I messed up as the person in an oppressed minority group, because gays have been persecuted throughout millennia, right? And therefore, we have reason to be guarded. I mean, right now, um, this is not necessarily gay, but like, you can't dress and drag <laughs> in certain parts of America now <laughs> because yeah. putting on a dress if you are a man is so threatening to I don't know who, <laughs> but we but you know heaven forbid they read books to children. Um, <laughs> yeah. But because we have that today, we have that today. I mean, perhaps there is reason in some ways to have our guard up and to be careful. I mean. If I have, I have many, uh, I have gay people in my life and in my family, and there is a part, especially if they're younger, there is a protective impulse that I have with my students saying, yeah, be careful if you go to a frat party. So in a sense, like what you're literally preaching against that you have learned that Chris Maxey, was Chris Maxey the exception or was he the rule? Does that make sense? And therefore, what is the way to approach how to be careful if you are an oppressed minority versus having a loving heart to everybody and saying, hey, everybody can come into my house. Everybody can come into my heart. Yeah. I mean, so you're absolutely right to point out that things are different from when I grew up, but especially depending on what part of the country you mm -hmm. live in, they're not necessarily better. And especially if you're trans or a trans person of color, they can be considerably worse. Uh, so it's not that that um, I grew up in a very particular era with some issues about masculinity that that have not been repeated, and in a cultural vacuum where uh, I like to say the the only gay people in movies either killed somebody or uh, or, or themselves, but um, which was horrifying as a kid that that's what we got. But going on to your question. Um, it's very important to me that people understand that in this book, I'm not saying we can be friends with everyone. Right. I do not believe we can be friends with everyone. I believe we can be friends with everyone who shares our values and that many more people share our values than we might think. And that when we're at our most tribal, we make assumptions about who shares our values based on things like they're a jock. And I'm a theater nerd, so they couldn't possibly share our values. So how do we know if someone shares our values? Well, it's basically how they move through the world, how they treat people, what they do. And I had ample opportunity to see that Maxi shared my values, but that what I flailed myself for is my mind kept going back to really a stereotyped prejudiced image I had of him based on uh, not just the fact that he was a jock, but he was headed towards the Navy SEALs and he served six years as a Navy SEAL. Uh, and uh, so what is very uh, heartwarming for me is uh, he never he never held that against me. Uh, and he wanted all of his mistakes to be in this book. He wanted the stupid things he said, the times he got me wrong, uh, he wanted them all in here. Uh, and I gave him the chance to take out anything. And he took out nothing. He actually well, did take um, He said, I know he drank a lot, 
but could you take out some of the drinking? Because it sounds like we drank literally all the time. And I took out fully two thirds of the drinking and everyone still says you guys drank all the time. Yeah, you guys did drink all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't drink much now. I drink, No, I do not drink much now. I do right. not. Yes, because um, life just gets at us. Life gets at us. I wanted to ask you, well, there's so many questions, but in terms of the structure of the book, in terms of how life gets at us, you divide it into um, very few chapters, actually. What is it, eight? Is it eight chapters? No, I'm sorry. So it's seven. Well, it, yes, it is eight chapters because you eight include chapters. coda, right? Yeah. So you have yeah. seven chapters and you have this coda. And I was curious. So chapter one is bright college years. And then two is 20s and 30s. Three is midlife, 40s, 50s, middle 50s, pushing 60. And I was curious, like, how did you arrive at this structure? It's very neat in a way. Oh, you have these decades. And yet, can I ask you, like, do you think our lives can be measured in decades? And was that as an organizing principle, how was that for you? It came to me fairly late. I just was writing scenes from Maxie in my life. And oh, okay. um, there is a, I won't spoil anything, but there's a dramatic medical event that happens to Maxie. And originally I started with that. Uh, and a very wise editor friend read it and said, I don't know you. I don't know Maxie. Why on earth do I care about his medical event or what you have to say about it? Would you please introduce yourself to us before you throw that at us? Um, so I decided, uh, as Julie Andrews would say, to start at the very beginning. Uh, and it just made sense. And then I realized I do see my life in decades. Uh, that I do see the bright college years as one, the end of childhood and the twenties as being this time in our life when we're still really finding ourselves and the thirties as being when we kind of say, uh, people start to go off in their own areas. They may or may not have families. They may or may not try to find a permanent place to live and so on and so forth. But I had fun. One of my little jokes was, 50s, mid 50s, pushing 60, because I, I had a lot to say about the last 10 years. So I, I cheated. <laughs> well, speaking of um, these decades, we also have the Will Schwalbe decades, but then we also have the Chris Maxey decades. And I've never seen a book like this where we have a comparison of two men having this very like deep friendship it's not a daily conversation. You guys don't operate. And I don't want to, you know, make this sort of gender description, but like a lot of, you know, women, if they're best friends or close friends, you don't really check in only, you know, every decade or every couple of years or, or, or have even a year where you don't speak. And here you check in and there's this kind of really intense intimacy. And do you think that's only possible when you have this early attachment, let's say, from a secret society. And speaking of which, I think we should we we have been remiss. Could you talk about what a secret society is for those who are uninitiated? I, I actually I was not in a secret society. I have been in clubs, but not in a secret society. So could you talk about that? I will do that. And I want to say before I do that, I uh so love that you picked up on the parallel thing because it is modeled on Plutarch's lives. Okay, okay. Where Plutarch did parallel lives. Uh and I love parallel lives. I, I love counterpoint. So that's why I did it that way. So the secret society uh, is an enormous limestone building on the edge of campus. It dates back to the 19th century. And my secret society had this unique charge that it gave itself of bringing together the 15 most different kids at Yale. And there were three requirements. You had to have dinner in the hall, as we called it, with the other 14 kids twice a week, and you could never miss. Uh, you had to give what we called an audit, which was a presentation of every single thing you could remember from your entire life that usually lasted anywhere from about four to seven hours of talking nonstop. And the audits, everyone bared their souls, and the rule was, what happens in the hall stays in the hall. 
So we all trusted one another not to reveal a thing. And the other uh, part of it was we had this fantastic uh, retreat in the fall and the spring when we all went off together. Oh, and one other thing, we would bring speakers into the hall after our audits were finished to talk with us about various topics. Uh, it was and is very well endowed and supported by alums. So kids, it cost zero to join. You never paid a cent. So it could draw kids from different economic strata. And every year at the end of the year, the 15 kids in it would choose unanimously the next 15 kids. But during the year, the hall is yours. There, there was a very nice caretaker couple who made delicious meals. We had a keg, unlimited tab at the liquor store, and most important, given the era, we had MTV. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, for the for the for the folks out there who aren't familiar with this world, I guess we can probably um, parallel it to, let's say, the finals club at Harvard, which was described, and the reason why Mark Zuckerberg created Facebook. He wanted to be tapped for a finals club, which is sort of like a secret society at Yale. And um, I think, I don't think he ever was, but he, he, he but it worked out for him, whatever. Okay. <laughs> if people want to get another sense of secret societies, uh, Lee Bardugo uh, is a marvelous author and her new book, Hellbent is the second. The first was called Ninth House in this series. And they take place at Yale secret societies, then they have horror and supernatural and all sorts of other great things going. But for, for people who want a big dose of secret society at Yale, read uh, Lee Bardugo. Oh, there you go. And then, so, and people have controversial points of view about secret societies, but yours was a co-ed, very not about money. Co-ed, very not about money. Even back in diversity, a third of the kids were kids of color, which was unusual in any organization or group then. And uh, the way I try to explain the secrecy is uh, we were told that it's obnoxious to talk about something that isn't open to other people. So they asked us to keep it secret because otherwise you're talking about it all the time and that's obnoxious. But they said to us, don't lie. If someone says, where are you going? Tell them. And you can bring your senior friends in anytime you like, except those two dinners to watch MTV and drink beer and whatever you whatever you like. Um, but they did say the point was to bond with the other 14. So we weren't obnoxiously secret. And uh, well, we weren't skull and bones, for example. No, totally. And uh, I approve of this. But what I thought was interesting, not so much about the secret society part, but not the secret part, but the society part, which is that it seemed like your secret society was a great social experiment. It, was, it had it was a great this- it had this sort of utopia aspect of it. And in a way, your book is an extension of what could this utopia mean in a life? Yeah. Is that fair? That is absolutely right. Um, so one of the things that really moved me, uh, of the 15 kids in our secret society, one decided to leave the college before the year began. One, um, as you know from the book, died. Um, so that left 13, 10 of us were either in touch or showed up at my signing in New York City. Um, we uh, have remained tight. And so the social experiment worked and uh, it surprised me how much it worked. Uh, it is having that intense experience of uh, bond, really, really bonded us and we're all there for each other. It's really extraordinary. And I, I was reading recently a study that does speak to the theme of the book, where if you assign kids seats in a classroom, uh, they will become friends with some of the kids who sit around them. But if you let them choose their own seats, they are highly likely only to become friends with the people they think are exactly like them. Well, I, I, as a teacher, because I teach at a college and in my writing classes, I make my students or 15 students in each of my classes because I have to have maximum enrollment and I have this waiting list. And in the classes, I make them have a group chat in which I'm excluded from it. So cool. And I tell them that they must share their interests. They must talk about the music, the television, the, the books they're reading, 
like the thing, and also if one of them is feeling sort of down, I might say, hey, you know, like John is feeling down. Somebody needs to check in on him. That's not my job. It's your job. <laughs> and and if you see one of you guys at the hallways in the dining room, I want you to sit with them and have meals. I want you to get to know each other because being writers, you need each other. And what I really thought was so beautiful about your secret society is not the exclusivity of it, which I think we have prejudices about that. But what I really loved about it is the enforced dynamic of people. The and what yeah. it's enforced, like you can't not do it if you want to have the alcohol. <laughs> exactly. And the fact that we had to have dinner twice a week and couldn't miss meant we could be our real authentic selves. We could say stupid things and know that we had to see each other. Uh, three days later or four days later. And one of the echoes of this is I write in the book about how Maxie goes on to found an extraordinary school on the island of Eleuthera in the Bahamas called the Island School. Uh, and it's an unbelievable place, but he has brought the spirit of the secret society to the school. And one of the things he does is there's a kayak trip a couple days in and he waits to choose the kids for the kayak trip until he sees who's friends with whom. And then he breaks up all the friend groups and he sends kids off with the people who are not their friends and they become friends for life. And well, that's directly I really found right. that, oh, I just thought that was so beautiful. And I was just curious. And in the book, you tell us, because the premise begins with, I be, I'm going to write an entire book about the person I was not meant to be friends with, according to me. Yeah, <laughs> according to me, exactly. According to me, <laughs> not according to anybody else. And I think I was right, but it turns out I was really, really wrong. So can we talk about this friendship? Can we talk about, um, well, also, before we talk about the friendship, we know what you didn't like about him initially, but secretly, if you had to really admit to yourself, what did you find that you were drawn to about Maxie from beginning to end? So Maxie though he is loud and obnoxious, has impeccable manners. And he was raised by his extraordinary mother and father on what they called the Maxi Code. And when you meet him, shakes your hand, he looks you in the eye. He too is very interested in other people and uh, asks, he wants to know people, he wants to meet people. He's a sponge uh, and he's charismatic. He's a leader, you wanna follow him. Uh, so there was there is a lot to like on first meeting Maxi, but he is really loud and really obnoxious, and I am a very contained person. And so even to this day, things like I, I'm not a hugger. I really don't like hugging. I this is a theme in the book. I, I would have been happy in Edwardian times, just kind of nodding. Uh, and he gives me the biggest bear hugs whenever he sees me. And now his wife does it and his four kids do it too. Um, and I still don't like it, but they do. So I like to, and this is a very much a theme in the book that Maxi pushes me past my limits a little bit, not too far, but a little bit. And I like that. It's funny. I almost felt like you had to be, because you're so smart, and because you had been exposed to so much culture so early, in a way, I almost kept on thinking that you had um, a kind of resistance and that resistance had to be broken by somebody whose sheer force of will and vitality was um, what matches yours. Like yeah. he yeah. became your worthy rival in a way. And, and oddly, the worthy rival becomes an intimate and a confidant and a person that you need to just breathe with. Like that's how the book sort of works. I was curious about communication. He has one form of communication, like the hugging versus you're like, <laughs> um, and versus you not. And I was curious in terms of this one beautiful, beautiful paragraph. I don't know why it moved me so much. I mean, there's so many beautiful, there's so much beautiful writing in this book, but this one section in here, um page 179 i was wondering if you could read this one paragraph that you and i it starts with i was supposed and ends with make things worse great i'd love to i was supposed to be the words guy and i'd always believed that i could find the right ones more and more i was discovering that just as maxi's body was failing him words were starting to fail me i was beginning to think that 
no matter how much I trusted the power of language, there were situations in which nothing I could say would make things any better and that what I said might even make things worse. I mean, that realization of words and its um, limitations for people who love words like you, love text as much as you do, love narrative and meaning as much as you do. I mean, I don't think I know anybody who's as well-read as you are. <laughs> and I know lots of well-read people. So, and I was curious about that realization and that beautiful chapter before and after that entire section and what what are the life events that um, made you feel this way? So Maxie was going through a terribly difficult time in his life. Um, for lots of reasons. Um, and he confided in me. And I think partially because we came from such different worlds. And I'm not even just talking about the straight gay or jock theater nerd. There's also this thing too about uh, him having served in the military, having been a Navy SEAL for six years. And I think very often civilians don't know what to say around military people. We admire them, we're grateful, but we are, it's very common to be worried about saying the wrong thing. And I was really on, on multiple levels, just grasping for the right thing to say, uh, to comfort him, uh, especially around a, a terrible mistake he had made that, that had tragic consequences or that he felt he had made. It actually wasn't his mistake, but, but there had been a tragedy that he felt responsible for, um, even though he really wasn't. And uh, I just couldn't come up with the words. I just couldn't. I was trying so hard and I couldn't. But the great realization that I had then was he just needed me to sit with him. And, and we, were, we started our conversation by talking about listening. He just needed me to listen and not, not flinch and not walk away and not break eye contact, not tell him everything would be okay when I wasn't sure everything would be okay, uh, not tell him I didn't think he did anything wrong because I know he thought he did something wrong even though I didn't, but just be with him, just sit with him. And... Uh, that was that was a powerful moment for me as a words guy, because that was really the first time I thought, you know, if words do fail you, just sit, just be there. Well, let's go to that point, because you're talking about Maxie at that moment. But for me, it's interesting having read the end of your life book club. And because right at that moment, when you talk about Maxie, you're also talking about your mother. Because that's what follows. So that becomes a transition for the next section about your mother's illness and her um, terrible diagnosis. Yeah. So my mother had been diagnosed with stage 4B pancreatic cancer, which is about as bad a cancer diagnosis as anyone can get. Um, and so uh, it seemed highly likely that she only had three to six months to live when in fact she lived almost two years, but it's, uh, you know, the ending when, when someone gets that diagnosis. And the counterpoint is there to set up a lesson that Maxie taught me that is maybe the most valuable thing that Maxie has taught me in our 40 year friendship, which is he gave me the incredible gift of being vulnerable with me that he was really sharing his entire life with me. And I was in this mode where I'm thinking, I have to be here for Maxie. I have to say the right things. And I'm not gonna give him my mess. I'm not gonna tell him the full story of what I'm gonna go through. I'm not gonna tell him my own feelings of sadness and guilt and all the crazy things you feel when someone you love is dying. And I thought I was giving him a gift by not sharing. And what he taught me is the greatest gift you can give a friend is to be vulnerable with them and to let them help you. Yeah, it's so interesting. Like in Korean, there's a whole language of pudam, like this burden. So I don't wanna burden you with my sadness. I don't wanna burden you with my worries, my concerns, like person X is having problems and I don't know what to do. But actually what you're learning from Maxie and also what, 
because you were saying you wanted to be there for Maxi, and in the failure of your words or what you thought were your failure of your words, you had to be there with him. But in a way, his being with you, if you allowed him, is another way you develop this love for each other, right? It's exactly it. It's exactly it. Um, and so the failure of words was twofold. Um, one was thinking that there was something I would say that would be the right thing, but also failing over the course of that part of our relationship to share with him what I was going through, to share my sadness, worry, anxiety, fears. And I was curious, when you think about the, I mean, I don't know if people understand who might not have read your other works, they probably have because we are all diehard Schwalbe readers, is your profound need for books. And I I share your disease. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, and I think it's funny because I've, I've, I've read your writings about this when you essentially say books don't disappoint us yeah. and we can't disappoint books. <laughs> we can't disappoint books. They don't, books right. don't need to share anything with the book. But one of the things, and I have been thinking about this increasingly, is you were asking me questions about the secret society yeah. and about how it, it brought people together and who wouldn't have known each other's stories otherwise, and about this four to seven hour storytelling that we do. And to me, that's books. That's called books. That, in fact, we can reproduce the experience of the secret society to some extent just by reading books that we didn't think would interest us and letting someone tell us their story over the course of a book. Um, and I mean, fictional stories as well as memoir. Um, so that's one of the reasons I love books so much is I can continue exactly what happened in that secret society. I share my stories, I put them in books, but I can get millions of stories. How cool is that? Well, I was thinking about how sometimes my secret societies in life are people who have read the books that I've read that very few people have read. <laughs> 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 it's like a private elite, um, kind of flex I guess that's what the children would call it but like I remember someone had said to me oh and he was a very cool person that I had met in the literary world when I got to be about 30 or something and I hadn't been in that literary world and he was talking about Italo Svevo's The Conscience of Zeno mm -hmm. yeah and I remember like and then I was like oh I'm gonna read that book and then I read the book and I thought oh that's so interesting <laughs> and then all of a sudden if I ever met some, it wasn't even like my favorite book. It's just a book. It's a, it's an interesting book. I, I think it's, you know, whatever, but wh whenever I would meet somebody who, who would have read that book, I would think like, Oh, they read that. That's so weird. Or like Zuleika Dobson, like another, you know, a curious kind of weird <laughs> book, uh, Max Beerbaum or something. And what I was thinking about is that when you had said earlier somewhere, I can't remember, it might have been in one of your, it might have been in Books for a Living, how books, we can't disappoint books. But what I wanted to say is if you extrapolate that idea and you bring it back to we should not be friends, um, we disappoint each other, right? Mm -hmm. Even people who you really admire, especially after decades, you're like, you know what? I really admire Maxie. He really is my friend. He really has been there for me. And even he has disappointed me. Yes. And how do we keep going on? Because with books, you could just literally promiscuously go like, I like this one. I like this one. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one too. <laughs> but it's not my only book. It's but not my only book. And it's not I my only Maxie. There is a, a one of the epigraph quotes that um because I'm three because I'm greedy with epigraph quotes is uh all friendships of any length are based on a continued mutual forgiveness without tolerance and mercy all friendships die David White right and he, that's that's friendship there's we're constantly disappointing each other and forgiving each other and how cool is that like we're humans um, where do you feel like you want the most forgiveness for in your um in in this book of your relationship with Maxie do you feel like you needed more forgiveness I feel like he we we gave each other all the forgiveness we needed but I feel like 
I always worried about sins of commission. Mm. Um, and what I needed more forgiveness for were sins of omission. That it wasn't that I said or did the wrong thing as much as I worried I might have. It was the times when I held back. And that's what I needed forgiveness for. Wow. And the thing is, when you do hold back in a way, the losses are mutual. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's not a net positive. Like I think that's what's sort of interesting when you hold back. It's like you don't actually get anything more than pride. Yeah. I mean, you don't hold back because you you're scared about putting yourself out there. And I can sit in my, as you started at the beginning, I can sit in my cocoon in my apartment and I'm here with my books and my husband and he's off doing his thing. And I can get on the the computer and just say everything. But when I'm with the person who I love and care about, a friend, um, it's hard for me to turn off the little tape in the head that says, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. And it's not just with Maxi. It's a little tape, I think, that runs in a lot of our heads because um, it goes back to earliest mem memories of, you know, fifth grade or seventh grade and just the fear of saying the wrong thing. Uh, so I'm always learning that. And Maxie's teaching me that too. So, you know, it sort of kills me because I think a lot about the First Amendment. I do some work with Pan America. And one of the things that I keep hearing stridently from many corners of the United States is people feel like they're being silenced. People who feel like they can't say the things they want to say, and they feel like people aren't allowing them for fear that they would be fired in, in the extreme sense, or they would lose their position with the right people, <laughs> or they might be disgraced, right? I don't want to use all these other silly words like canceled, but what I was wondering is for me, and I wonder for you, because we both belong to um, either oppressed groups or having been persecuted in other situations. And when you are a person who has less power, like in the hierarchy of society, very often you do walk around saying like, oh, I can't say that. I, I yeah. shouldn't say that. <laughs> so I walk around there all the time thinking like, I don't feel silenced by for fear of offense. I'll, actually, I just feel silence, period. I've always, I always have. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. So I, I, what, 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 oh, sorry. I'm just, no, but I'm just curious, like what you think of, do you feel like in a way you're actually saying, I need to unsilence myself in order to have love? Yes, I need to, I need to be safe. So I need to keep my mouth shut in situations where there is clear and present danger. Um, But I need to, trust more people who have proven to me that they love me. I need to trust them more with my true authentic self and not, not hold back. And it's always scary. It's never not scary, but uh, it's, it's so worthwhile. Oh, but okay. So I have to stop you because you had said that you have to be more authentic with the people who've proved themselves to be safe. Yeah. Now, then how do we in our middle age, well, as good as we look, <laughs> yeah, middle age is, is right. Well, <laughs> but how do we in our middle age develop new friendships with people who have improved themselves? How do we actually make ourselves vulnerable to all the new people that we could love and be loved by? Yeah. I think um, that. We need to widen our pool. So we need to introduce ourselves to more people. Mm -hmm. um, that's something my mother taught me and I try to do it, but she was much better than I was. She was the person who talked to the person sitting next to her on an airplane. And I was, was that person. That whoever, yeah. And I was always the person who put my headphones on and put the book in front of my face and sent out like, don't talk to me vibes. And I have very purposefully now I take off the headphones, I put away the book for a second, and I, I make myself open for conversation. I've met some amazing people. Okay. And so then do you, the pool. And do you think that's what Chris has taught you? Maxie has taught you? Yes. Maxie talks to everybody. He's kind of like my mother in that respect. He just talks to everybody. He's one of those people who introduces himself and to everyone. Um, can we talk about death? <laughs> yes. I talk because, about death a lot. 
it, it's so funny because when uh, for those uh, you could tell right now from Will's persona that he's so full of love and life and there's a, so much vitality in him and yet in this work there is both that vitality and warmth but there's always a sort of specter of death that's a through line of this book and it starts with AIDS yeah right? I mean the the awareness of AIDS at a young as a young person and as a young gay person especially when we knew so little about AIDS I mean it was remarkable how little we knew about AIDS right because I, I mean I you and I are similar in our ages. And I remember when AIDS became known to us. And then also it was first, it was herpes. I remember like the time magazine, like herpes, like this, this going to kill us. And now we're like eh, herpes, who doesn't have herpes? <laughs> and, then, and then AIDS came about and we're like, Oh, it's going to kill all of us. And now it's like, no, it's not going to kill all of us, but it did kill so many, many, many people in this world. And we still don't have the vaccine. And I was curious um, when you think about your activism, and th do you feel like in that political identity that you have as an activist, as a person who is so deeply aware of how isolating and punished people were for having had AIDS and for having loved people and uh, all the judgment and the cruelty that the gay population had to suffer in the worst part of the pandemic of AIDS? I was curious, like, how did that affect your capacity to be open to people who are not in your community? It had a dual effect. I, because in 1983 was sowing my wild oats, uh, as I had since I started to come out at 16, uh, I had gone to a lot of bars and bathhouses and clubs and done everything you could ever do with the whole group of people, one of whom was the first person I know to die of something that I quickly became certain was AIDS. So I did feel with some good reason to feel that way that I was not going to live to see 25. Uh, I spent my early 20s uh, quite convinced that I was going to die. And that actually did help me get past some of my introversion. And one of the reasons I joined the secret society was thinking, I have to squeeze in everything in whatever time I have, I've got to squeeze it all in. And this crazy thing, why not? Like, why not do it? Um, so the awareness of death, the memento mori, really opened me up to this idea of just more life, just cramming in life, move to Hong Kong, uh, to write documentary films, write a play, um, whatever, just more, more, more. Uh, more drinking, more dinners, more people. Um, and there is something powerful that, and, and while I was doing that in my parallel structure, Maxi was a Navy SEAL. And so in the military, there's a very real possibility that you won't live to see 25. Um, and so uh, the reason I keep coming back to death again and again in this book and actually why I write about it so much because it's books for living is the book about death and, and if you're like book club is also sort of a book about death um obviously um is that it gives me incredible gratitude for life it's that's the that's the secret well I think what's sort of amazing to me is one doesn't have to respond to death in that way with a, a greater wish for life, with a greater capacity and a generosity um, and an openness, it could be that you say, I'm going to go into conservation mode. Like, I don't know how much battery left. I better, you know, like turn down the lights. Yeah. And you actually went this other way. And I was thinking about where one gets the courage for that. Well, for me, it's, it is because I was so sure that I wouldn't live to see 25 or 30. Um, it's all bonus time. And I can say this genuinely, I do not fear death. Um, it's all bonus time. I consider everything that's happened after 25 to be this unbelievable gift. Uh, you know, I love that so much. And do you want to talk about the medical issues of both Maxi and you? Like, is that a spoiler? Because there is no, a parallel frailty that happens in this book. So um, Maxi, um, when I talked about that medical issue that I originally started the book with, uh, it's a brain tumor. 
Um, it's a kind of brain tumor that is non-malignant. It's called uh, an acoustic neuroma, um, but he needed a very complicated six hour operation. It was dodgy. It left him with uh, no hearing in one ear and with dizziness that will be permanent. I have a something called um, small fiber neuropathy, which is a kind of peripheral neuropathy um, where the small fiber nerves start to die from the outside in. Um, and it's a painful neuropathy that leaves me constantly dizzy. So we're two like 60 year old guys who are dizzy all the time. Uh, and yet we both feel you don't get to choose what you get. When you get to 60, everybody gets something and we are just so darn lucky to be here and to have a friend like each other. And I have friends like you and uh, it's all gratitude. I was talk. I went to my 33rd college reunion for research. I mean, I went because I wanted to see my friends, but I also had never been to a college reunion before. I'm the opposite <laughs> of um, the secret society. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what to do with my college. <laughs> it was a complex place of uh, very powerful, interesting human beings who inspire me. But like, I think the interpersonal part is a challenge, but I did read your book. So I feel like maybe I got it through osmosis. <laughs> and when I did go, uh, one of my college roommates said, oh, now we're at an age when we can do the organ recital where you start to recite the different organs. <laughs> and we talk about, well, my kidney's doing this, my heart is doing this. But um, can I ask you like what it's like to have this sort of, I don't know if it's a group chat or your Facebook group, like how do you interact with all these folks? And when you're with them, do you interact with them in a different way than you do with, let's say, people that you work with? My old secret society pals. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. We do because we, you know, I think actually, let me correct that. We interact the way that you interact with anyone who you had an intense long term experience with earlier in your life. So I don't interact with them qualitatively differently than I do with, say, my deep, dearest boarding school friends or someone I might have. Uh, had an early job with where we were in the first flush of our career and, and working together 24 seven. But there is this one additional thing with these people, which is there was a time when we shared with each other our most intimate secrets, and that's not always true. And what it does allow us to do is we always can pick up right where we left off, whether a year has gone by or 15. And that is an extraordinary thing. And that's one of the reasons that I, I, we're just right back. We go right back to where we were. Um, and I put on my Instagram, all of these pictures of us as kids, you can see everybody on my Will Schwalbe Instagram. And uh, that's how they look to me. I see that like people look to me, you haven't aged one bit since I met you, but let's say for the sake of argument you had, um, we were on the Asian American Writers Workshop board together, which was a super intense experience. Um, we were babies, yes. <laughs> we were babies, and that's how I see you. You are the Minjin Lee who I met at the Asian American Writers Workshop board, and that's one of the beauties of old friends. John Updike has a beautiful passage I read about that that I was trying to find, but I can't find it, but I'll find it at some point, about how coming together for reunions you you see the, the the baby faces in in the faces of adults. Well, I was also thinking about Maxie and you, and there's a famous like C.S. Lewis quote, which I can't. I'm paraphrasing, and I guess there are three of them that used to always have lunch, and they met regularly. And then when one of them died, they realized that the person who died brought out in the person who's living a different kind of me. Wow! Right. Right. Yeah. So and I thought about how just when you have this group of people and when one person disappears, it's almost like another part of you dies yeah. because you'll never see that person that that person brought out in me. Yeah. So I don't know what does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And it also is one of the things that I write about. It's one of the reasons I love not just Maxi, but love my friends is. I believe they see in me a better me than I see in me. And I want to be the me that they see. 
Oh, I love that. And also I thought the reason why this book would be so meaningful for readers is because I know everybody in a way has a kind of maxi. Everybody yeah. has a kind of will and a, and a person, everybody has a kind of will that a maxi brings out because maxi's will is different than David's will. Right. right. David being a uh, will's uh, partner and husband. So anyway, I'm just really happy to be here with Will and be um, to have Minjin's Will with me. <laughs> <laughs> and there's John. <laughs> How's our John? <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't have any questions from the audience. I think everyone like me was uh, completely wrapped by this conversation. Okay. Uh, and I, I, don't, I think we've lost no viewers. So I think everyone is willing for us to go on for another hour, but I won't, I don't want that to happen. But uh, perhaps if there's one more question uh, that we'd like to ask Will um, uh, before uh, we sign off. Oh, I have a question. I have a question. Um, are there, well, first of all, um, except for our books, Will, is there anything that you're reading right now that you want to recommend? Oh, I recommend okay. these books, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I will answer that question, but I'm going to be, um, I'm going to not follow orders for a minute, um, which is, uh, I I love the opportunity, man, of telling you um, in private and in public how much Free Food for Millionaires and Pachinko mean to me. They are such extraordinary books. I just, I I could go on for that hour that John was, was uh, uh, dangled in front of us talking about them. But I also um, love talking to someone right after they've read them uh, because <laughs> we have this huge thing in common of these books that we love. So I'm um, just going to say that for a second. Um, and I just am starting on Java Road um, by Lawrence Osborne. Uh, and he is a absolutely marvelous novelist based in Bangkok, I believe, uh, who is very prolific and writes fascinating books, and I recommend them highly. What about you? What are you reading other than my books? Oh, so in addition to Will Schwalbe's, um, we should not be friends, although we are friends and we should all be friends. <laughs> I'm reading uh, Poverty by Matthew Desmond, who I will be doing an event with, I think, at the end of this month. I've only said yes to two events this year. <laughs> I think, and it's Will and Matthew Desmond, uh, I think. Anyway, it's amazing. Oh, Have you seen this book yet? It's I really- know I haven't, but I it it's, looks amazing. You know. Wow. I mean, it, Evicted is an incredible book too. Oh, an inc- that, that amazing book. So it's, yeah. that, it's that Matthew Desmond, yeah. Oh. <laughs> That Matthew Desmond. And um, yeah. part of my enormous guilt in asking um, Min to do this favor and, and have this conversation with me is the idea that I've taken an hour away from her writing of American Hagwon. Um, no, no, no. Me, but it's okay. No, I'm so I'm so happy that I got to read this. And also I felt like I don't know, it, it gave me hope. It gave me hope to see two people love each other for decades. I mean it. And also to forgive, as you said, and to have mercy and to have grace for one another. And then also people always talk about how men don't have friends. I mean, I hear this stereotype all the time, like men don't need to talk, men don't cry, men don't have friends. And I think, no, that's such bullshit. And I think that this book is a great testament to the history of friends and the need that we have for friends. So we should not be friends, but we should be friends. (laughs) By the great Will Schwalbe. Thank you, Literary Bookstore. Please buy books from your independent bookstore. Yes. Thank you, Min. Thank you, Min Jin Lee. Thank you, Will Schwalbe, for joining us on At Home with Literati. Uh, it's just so lovely to have you both uh, virtually in our store. And I trust we'll have you both in our store physically, if not to talk to each other again, which I would love, then for your next books. Uh, but until then, be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great night, all. Take care.